<laughs> Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and Three Percent, in which we take a book, a big long book, a difficult book, break it down section by section, talk about it every week, um, have some fun, uh, have special guests on like we do today, and play our weird Two Month Review bingo. So if you don't have your Two Month Review bingo card, you should get it because I think you're gonna you're gonna win today. I really want someone to win. Um, so go to go to the Three Percent website, search bingo download your own individual card and play along with us. Um, I'm Chad Post from Open Letter and I'm joined as always by Brian Wood. Hi Chad. Um, it's getting longer and longer to introduce me and our special guests and I think that's very offensive, but that's I, fine. Continue. That's, <laughs> <laughs> and, and our special guest is Joala Race, who is a author of Translator and the author of The Translator's Bride, which Open Letter will be publishing next summer, May? Yeah. yeah. Sure uh, August, I guess. August? OK, yeah. August. Yeah, we, uh, so congratulations on that, first of all. I'm really excited. I just <laughs> read the book, um, a couple weeks ago in advance of uh, sales conference and pitched it really hard at our sales conference. So hopefully a lot of the, our sales reps who probably don't listen to this podcast, but if they do, <laughs> They're, they're very excited about it as well and are going to be selling it to every single independent bookstore and chain store in this country. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be published uh, by Open Letters. <laughs> no, I'm talking serious because I really appreciate your catalog. So, uh, And uh, hi, everyone. I'm Juan Reyes uh, from Portugal. <laughs> so in in Porto, uh, right? Not in Lisbon. In but up, Porto. Up no, not, not Lisbon, no. Are you from Porto originally? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. And so, do you want to describe? Let's start with your book, um, the novel. Do you want to describe the novel? Uh, I don't know. You want to do it? Maybe no. because it's a no. <laughs> no, okay. It's. Uh, I want to hear what you say. I want to hear what you say. Yeah, uh, no, it's uh, quite a short novel, not, not very long. Um, Finally, we get a short Finally, novel. Yes, a short novel. novel. Not, not like the, the book of this quiet. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like one section of what we read today is about yeah, as long. <laughs> probably, probably how many, how many words? Do you know how many words it is, give or take? I know 29,000, maybe. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. It's like that, yeah. But the short novel. So mm -hmm. the action takes place. So the action takes place in less than 48 hours, so less than two days. Uh, it's two days and one night, maybe, yeah. So it's quite, um, the the pace is quite fast, so you can read it. It, it was it, my intention to read it, so the reader could read it um, in a couple of hours, if he wants to, he, she wants to. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a book, it's not, you can't find a temporal reference throughout the book, but it's set in 1920, more or less, after the First World War, um, in which Portugal uh, participated or entered. But uh, it's not, uh, you can't uh, find Portugal throughout the book either, <laughs> but it's, it, you can you can relate to Portugal and it's Portugal actually, but, and the city, it's an, an unnamed city. Uh, it's not Lisbon, as I took a lot of references or um, from places I lived, even outside Portugal, like Sweden and Gothenburg, uh, some place like that. And I mixed and created a, an imaginary city. Some people can find references or uh, imagine to be uh, imagine it to be Lisbon or. Uh, any other city, but okay, it's irrelevant. So it's a translator, and he's a very pissed off guy <laughs> because <laughs> the publishers don't like pay him. And, <laughs> oh, like all translators, like all translators, he's not well paid, so he has to live in. A, <laughs> he has a very annoying landlady, uh, very obnoxious lady. That uh, it's, uh, she's always trying to. Um, uh, follow we also how do I say no I, I won't reveal that so she's a very annoying landlady so and he has to live in poor conditions and his bride uh, moved abroad um, and he's now alone in the city and he gets into his mind that he wants to buy a house to get his bride to come back to him 
because she moved abroad in um, looking for a, a new uh, new life, a uh, new job, and he gets into his mind that it must be a solution to to end this uh, loneliness, and because he wants that his bride or supposedly bride is fiance or. Uh, girlfriend, whatever you want, but he calls his, his bride, uh, calls she is bride, um, but um, he goes throughout the city and asks for his money, and um, while he does it, he rants all about, and he complains, and he, uh, because he despises people. It's quite a pessimistic <laughs> book. <laughs> no, it's not. He, uh, but uh, black humor book, uh, like black humorish, and um, Quite sarcastic take because it's in part because it's uh, the personality of the translator. It's a bit of mine person, my personality maybe, but not 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 <laughs> complete. But a part of it, uh, his his personality. It's my personality for sure. It, of course. It's a really yeah, wonderful it's, book. Like you, you but, it, it does have like a lot of momentum behind it. Like it's a fast read. It is. It is very much like in his mind, like where he's ranting and hating on like all the dirtiness of the people and the city and everything yeah. <laughs> sucks. And and I mean, some of it, you say you invented the city out of a lot of amalgam of different places, but mm -hmm. the publishers seem very much like true to life publishers who are just trying to screw yeah. over everyone yeah, that they can. by not <laughs> paying yeah. them and just getting attention for themselves. So that all yeah, feels very true to life. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's true because the, the publishers are based in real people. I can't oh, can tell you that. I have no doubt of <laughs> so the, 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 there's a lot of fi fiction, but there's a lot of reality chains for fiction, of, of course. But uh, I think this so, book is going to be a huge hit, actually. Like, uh, <laughs> of our book. I'm serious because I think a lot of people who are involved in like the translation world are going to. I've already drawn to the title, "The Translator's Bride," which sounds compelling. And then everyone in bookstores loves these sort of books that are small and dark and fun and like. And they, they always have like a Thomas Bernhard sort of notes from underground bit of a yeah, vibe, maybe. but not nearly <laughs> as like. And nihilistic it's much much closer to like a human human sounding voice in the end but uh or humanistic sounding voice but uh it's really fantastic and as a backwards lead in to the next question <clears throat> you translated it yeah wow actually I did. <laughs> which is it was like, not not the, the intention as you know it was not the uh, it was supposed to be another person but yes in the end i i translated it yes uh, yeah. <laughs> I had yeah. to, but yeah, yeah, it was very fun to do it. And you just was it a different experience. Like yeah, was it a you different experience a different translating experience. your own work versus others? Yes, uh, because first it's my first uh, translation into English. Yes, I, I I am a translator by by profession, but I translate into Portuguese. I translate Swedish, Danish, uh, Icelandic, and. Um, Norwegian <laughs> into Portuguese, but uh, as you know, uh, Portuguese is my mother language, not English, of course, as you might notice. <laughs> but uh, so it's uh, first experience in that in that field, mm -hmm. and and uh, translating my own work, it's also uh, for for the first time. So it's different than I'm used to translate other people's work. So it's uh, a different take. On translation, uh, because I know the, the I know perfectly well the the original version. Yeah, I wrote it, so it's different. Yeah. It's because I know what I want to do with this and how I can change it into another language. And sometimes, in when you translate uh, other people's work, okay, I fully understand this, but should I use this word or should I use this? sentence and sometimes you can't ask the, the writer because they're dead <laughs> so, yeah. so I, can, I can i can't ask two times so no do you want me to translate this to portuguese no is that so i can i can't ask it yeah I, I have to guess so <laughs> um so it's quite different it quite turned different out really well with, like it's it's really well done like it's remarkable like if you if no one knew that you were the translator of it, I think they would assume that someone like an English speaking translator of Portuguese and English had translated it. I don't think they'd have any question about it. Like I, I know that Kai has gone through it and I've gone through it and they're like a few moments where we have, where we're asking you to 
to clarify something or whatever, but mm -hmm. so it's like so good already that, that you can <laughs> see the voice, you can feel the voice and it's just like making sure that everything's absolutely perfect. Yeah, so, yeah. Which, so you I'm translate from all the various that. languages, which, um, what, what books that have you translated that you're most proud of? Uh, probably Mysteries by Kuno Thompson because oh, yeah. I'm a Amson fan. Yeah. And, uh, what, what else? Uh, maybe the, the Red Room by Strindberg. Uh, wow. Some that I, I translated Laxness to. Um, and uh, actually, I, I translated an, an Australian writer. One of my favorites, actually, not a Scandinavian this time. It was uh, Voss of Voss by Patrick White. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. I like, I I like Patrick. Book, but I've, I've always wanted to read that book, but I never have. I think that, if I'm, unless I'm misremembering, that's the book that the Penguin Editions has um, an eye on the cover, and it's gross. Maybe I, I, I read. <laughs> Like I, 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 read, I, I, uh, I like, used to. Uh, that book is amazing, but I'm just like, fuck that! I don't like that cover at all. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why. I used the vintage edition, so no, no why at all. <laughs> uh, maybe. It. I think it's that one that has it. It's one of those ones. It's one of his books that has like one edition has like a big eye on it, and it's just so disturbing to me. I don't. I think that there's like a trend I've noticed that people putting eyes on books, and I do not like it in the least like there's a bunch of them too and once you start noticing it you'll see it all the time it's, i just think it's just unnerving the same um peter mendelson that did the um new editions version of this all the kafka ones he did had the yep. eye yep. on it like a big huge eye i don't know if at that least was that's a not a that he was an eye. no i know but uh he had um several of them have eyes on the like all, all the different types of kafka books that were i think cannot for whoever but uh, yeah. yeah, interesting. So what? What? Here's a big general question to get into the uh, the Pessoa part of this. What role does Pessoa have, like, over as a Portuguese writer? Um, what kind of like uh, role does he hold over you, or sway does he over over you in the way that like people, American writers now would always look back to like Hemingway or Graham and Carver, perhaps or whatever. Mm. Different people have had that influence that that rests on like how you can write nowadays in English based on the success of these other people. What is, what is Pessoa's role to a Portuguese writer? Uh, talking about me, the uh, first thing. Uh, or anyone, this anyone. is the cover. It's not boss, it's the yeah. sectionist. Oh, Holy yes. moly. That is, yeah. yeah, that's not <laughs> a book. It's, it's another one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen that book a bunch of times, it's been like, absolutely not. <laughs> so, Answering your question, yeah. um, I wouldn't say he's a direct influence on my work, but sure, maybe some influence, and uh, maybe over every Portuguese writer nowadays, because you know, so it's like you have to study him at school. It's like it's part of the curriculum from secondary school. You have to study him and uh, some poems, not not a book of this quiet actually, but right. uh, probably Albert Campus and uh, uh, some parts from The Message, another uh, one of his books. Uh, actually, I prefer it to the book of this quiet, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, but so you, so he's very. Um, were almost worshipped in Portugal because he's, uh, I don't know if you know it, but he's not, he's not uh, uh, buried in the National Pantheon, but he's buried in the Geronimus, uh, the monastery, it's a big monastery in Lisbon, it's one of our biggest monuments, so it's, uh, he has uh, his tomb there, so it's quite a symbolic one, so it means he's a, the only two other people that are buried there are Camões, another one of our, you know, the the Lusiots, yes, yeah. the, the Lusiots, and the Vasco da Gama, the navigator. So it means a lot to be buried there. So you can see it by that fact how how important uh, Franco is 
in Portugal and in Portuguese society are yeah. is part of our canon. Uh, you can you can it's very difficult to say oh I don't like uh, so uh, oh people you don't like so <laughs> but it's the genius <laughs> it's a genius it's the most important poet in the 20th century uh, so it's quite um, a national treasure it's like uh, yeah. you can't nowadays you <laughs> at least it, he was a poet nowadays you can you can't uh, go against or um, talk uh, bad about uh, Cristiano Ronaldo so <laughs> things uh, <laughs> times, times are changing and he's our national uh, hero now but <laughs> He's a soccer player, so <laughs> he's yeah. gonna be buried uh, right next to Pessoa. So he probably yes, will be. Yeah, Just probably. Get ready for it. No, he's going. He's no, he's going to the Pantheon because we had Eusebio. Eusebio, yeah. another fo uh, soccer player, football player. So, okay, I'm talking mostly to American people. Yeah, so, yeah, soccer we player. Play. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and he went to. He was uh, moved to uh, the national Pantheon. So, Are you why not? Yes. <laughs> why not? Why not? Why not? Yes, sure. But yeah, of course. They can, uh, yeah, they can make a giant CR7 monument. Giant, yes. Maybe you can even bury him alive or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Go put in. No, no. Just, it no. needs to have like so, a lot of hair gel, too. <laughs> 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 but uh, returning to your question, let's be serious for a moment. <laughs> 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 so no, that counts as uh, yes, a it, digression on the bingo card, though. So it's <laughs> okay. So, so I, I guess so as a, a lot of influence, uh, most most writers, um, and uh, even though I don't like everything he wrote or appreciate it the same way, like I was telling you, that I I prefer his. Um, Fernando uh, Albert Campos uh, Atronim to Ricardo Reis or uh, Fernando Suarez or whatever. Um, I guess he was at least in some way a genius or a literary genius. Yeah. And um, some of his works are really good, at least when you read it in Portuguese. It, uh, of course, I, most of it, I, I checked this edition that you were following this competition, right. these sections, but I knew I knew them in Portuguese. Right. Course, but it, it's a good translation, by the way. So <laughs> you can get the feeling to, no, nothing to, <laughs> to, against it. But uh, sometimes, I don't know, maybe it works. If it works best in Portuguese or better in Portuguese, then. And English, a, that, 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 that's a problem with poetry, I guess. But yeah. um, in this in this uh, particular case, in the book of this quite, I, I think you get the same feeling in English that you get uh, from in, reading it in Portuguese. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that you getting a, a different feeling, but uh, but yeah, sure. Um, I can't really say that that nowadays we have uh, poets or uh, general writers or fiction writers, whatever, that write in the vein of so, even taking into account his prose uh, works, that he wrote some short stories. I don't know if you have it, uh, you have them in English, it probably is. not. Uh, some nice, nice uh, short stories. One of them is The Anarchist Panther. Um, and some other so it's quite funny. Yeah. Just uh, it out there, if you were to translate one of his short stories to English, I'm pretty sure you could get it placed just about any magazine you want. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> there's a there's a there's an interesting that, kick with Pessoa right now in uh, yeah, in America. That's, that's, an, that's a, so, uh, interesting I'm, idea. That'd be worth worth trying yeah. if you're interested. You should you should translate it under a heteronym. Under your translator <laughs> heteronym. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. You would do a for every language that you work from. But yeah, I would. I would love the opportunity to read yes, a, a short proposed. story of his. Would be. would be yeah, interesting to see. I would love to see that too, because like so much of this uh, is just atmospheric, but with like the little punchy aphorisms in the middle, yeah. and like mm -hmm. to see what a story would be and how he would contain that 
within some sort of larger narrative would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that's the thing that, as we've said before, and just reiterating like from last week's podcast, mm -hmm. that it is the difficulty with this book is like, we are forcing ourselves to read it straight through and there's nothing yeah. that pulls you through. It's just pieces. You could just read it like you were saying before we got started, like some people could use this like their, their Bible and like at yeah, night read exactly, like a couple yeah. passages or read a passage and meditate on that in the way that yeah, some yeah. people read the Bible and meditate on those passages. And that makes sense. But trying to do this particular podcast with it is like, just does not fit. And, uh, but imagine that if you try to read the Bible straight through cover to cover, like the crazy. Christian Bible, like what, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you, mad? Is it just to say, it's just to say you did it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that it gets taught. I, I, there's some academic out there that listens to this who's like, we teach the Bible as literature at my college. Don't. Knock That's it. fine, but like you can you can just take a piece. All right, now let's take a piece from over here and a piece from over here. Like it, it's overwhelming. The language is so dense and it's so like full. Like to just sit and read chunks of it is like is very overwhelming. It's, I, it's, yeah. a, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. Yeah, I remember yeah. when I was a kid, and my my mom's very religious, and uh, on like uh, Good Friday, she was very into like celebrating good friday or making me understand the importance of good friday and so on and so forth and so she made me like sit down with the bible and at that moment i was like i'm just gonna read the whole thing and i think i made it through like <laughs> the first two or three books and just gave up yeah but then yeah. i mean revelations that's fun that's fun. i made it to numbers and boy that was a long Ooh. one yeah yeah i have I, I had a similar experience i i read maybe four books from the beginning yeah, genesis yeah. and then you have what exodus like, Exodus and uh, I don't know what <laughs> a lot of sacrifices and yeah. <laughs> burning, <laughs> burning. Yeah, Genesis uh, and Exodus are interesting, and, and then you get to Leviticus, and it's like just weird laws and yeah, yeah, yeah. how to how to build a temple with fire, and you're just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Lord of the Rings, but you know, not nah, for sure. So, what, what would you say for for yourself in particular? What do you appreciate um, about Pessoa's writing? Uh. I appreciate it. It's, it's quite straightforward most of the mm -hmm. time because it, it, it doesn't try to be, uh, and it's um, a big tendency or trend in Portuguese uh, literature uh, throughout the ages, and you can even sense it today to be a lot, uh, to be um, flowery. <laughs> I don't know how to put it, you know, like that's a everybody. What, what what you can say in one sentence, they try to say it in one page and with a lot of uh, um, difficult words and to sound very uh, uh, to say, to to make it so. Uh, it's very difficult to actually to to explain this if you. Maybe if you don't uh, speak Portuguese, but, uh, how do I, how do I say it? Like um, okay, it's the best example. It's like if you can say it one sentence, they say it in one page. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but not not in a postmodernist style, you know. It's not oh, like sure. postmodern. Not uh, try to um, yes, it's sugary, it's flowery. They yeah, a little purple. Um, yeah, probably. This, this is uh, a question for you guys as writers that, um, and I, I, but you both write fiction, you both probably have a better perspective on this, but I know that there's always the, the idea to resist like cliches and resist things that are commonly stated. And as a result, I feel like some of these books I read are resisting that so far that they are going into this like page long descriptions for something that could be condensed into like a simple line, but are trying to avoid the cliche of that or the simplicity of that. Is that like an impulse that you see in, in contemporary fiction these days or am I just way off base? Uh, Brian, do you want to answer? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm not as read across, you know, uh, internationally the way you guys are, but um, I think in American fiction, um, I don't know, there's kind of like a pendulum swing. Like obviously there was, it got very sparse and very, very clean for a while. And now it's kind of swung back where they're pushing against that and being a little more flowery. And then maybe it'll swing back to being a little bit more, um, you know, more like realism or, or modernism where it tightens up a little bit more. But um, I don't know. I think it ebbs and flows. I, I always kind of resist that urge because I just don't want to waste anybody's time. 
<laughs> so I try to be, <laughs> and I'm always afraid I'm gonna get exposed as a fraud. Mm -hmm. And the more I write, the more they'll realize I'm a fraud. So if I keep it really tight, maybe they won't know. So <laughs> that's, 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 good plan. <laughs> that's just my self-defense mechanism, I guess, to keep it really compact. <laughs> I guess funny. My self defense mechanism for all the the blog posts I write is to make them super long so that no one ever reads them, and that way sure. they never know that I'm sure. because they can't get through it all. There was this really bad um, HBO uh, biopic of uh, Thomas Wolfe and um, Max Perkins, and it was supposed to be about Max Perkins. Like he gets this first draft of I forget which I haven't read much Thomas Wolfe, but like his book was like a thousand and eighty. It was like three thousand pages manuscript form when when Perkins got it. And there's this one page where he's trying to explain what the lady looked like. Like her eyes were blue, cerulean blue, blue like the ocean, but the ocean after the sun had hit it and the wave had crested. And, it, and he's like, bullshit. And he's like crossing it all out, right? And it's like this, it's like three pages of it. And by the end of like two days of work, it just goes, her eyes were blue and he fell in love. Like, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> like, and it took him like, and at the end of it, he's like, I love you, Max Perkins. <laughs> But it's like, yeah, I mean, like, just what, what are you trying to say? Just get to it. Don't, don't do a whole page of every type of blue that's ever existed in the world and every way to say it. <laughs> that is like that, that sort of directness is the part like in this section, the, I don't think I said this at the top, but like we were going through sections 222 through 273 um, for today. And this one has the parts that I like about this are like those one off sort of lines. Like I don't. Again, there's like no narrative, there's no way to describe any of this, but there's like a lot of good like little lines in here that are kind of provocative or like or like little daggers. Like, um, oh God, where was the one that I just had? Like, this is related to what we were just saying. Why write if I can't manage to write any better? <laughs> 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 and then there's like even below that, yes, to write is to lose myself, but everyone gets lost because everything in life is lost. <laughs> Like there's great little bits. Like it is back to our like instrument yeah, yeah, yeah. poetry, but like and this time it's more aphoristic and less like, oh poor me, emo me, like blah, blah. Like <laughs> <laughs> all impressions are incommunicable unless we make literature of them. We never love anyone. We love only our idea of what someone is like. We love an idea of our own. In short, it is ourselves that we love. These are great like aphoristic things. I mean, it's, I can see where like like going back to the biblical thing, like just reading one of these and being like, yeah, yeah, I get that. I like that. That's, that's cool. Reading a bunch of them in a row, it can be like, I don't think we need all this. Like <laughs> this book could be like 120 pages and I think it would be fine. No, because more is better. More is not better <laughs> in this case. More is better when we're talking about Frazan. More is not better when we're talking about this book. Um, that's, a, that's a hot take for everyone out there. Um, what did you think this time, Brian? Uh, there's one um, part in particular um, I'd love to bounce off of you guys. Um, okay. It's section 227. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the New Directions version, yeah. it's on page 241. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how to pronounce the name correctly, but... Um, Cairo. So, Cairo. Um, Cairo. The natural conclusion he draws from the smallness of his village, receiving from them what I feel to be both inspiration and liberation. According to him, because his village is small, you can see more of the world there than you can in the city. And in that sense, his village is larger than the city. He says, because I am the size of what I see, I am not the size of my own stature. Um, and then he expounds upon that more and more and more. Um, but I really like that idea of, because I always wondered why, why the Book of Disquiet, it always talks about, it's almost like a street on Lisbon. Like you don't really see all of the city or all of Portugal or all of like it's very very small and very very contained, um, but within doing that, he's able to almost make it like bigger than the world. Um, and I found that very very fascinating. Um, I, I, you know, I, I was thinking of other writers that that do that as well, that kind of purposefully keep their world very small but explore it in such wonderful huge ways. Um, was that something that you did with? Um, with your book? Yeah, I guess so, yes. It's a very contained, spatial and temporal, temporally speaking, contained yeah. book, but it tries to get a um, larger sense of what is to be human or Portuguese or whatever you want. I guess so uh, it's one of the, uh, one of the things I like in him. It's, 
exactly what you said. And but by the way, I don't know if you, you know, Cairo, uh, Albert Cairo is one of these other heteronyms. Same. That's uh -huh. yeah, he's not a real um, poem, right? Yeah. Not a real poem, yes. It's Fernando Pessoa again. So, <laughs> but it, it's quite different from uh, Suarez. Uh, he's uh, more. Uh, we studied uh, Cairo too in school. It's cool, uh, and it's, <laughs> it's more uh, paganist and neo-paganist poet. He's not. Uh, he's almost. Uh, he, he almost can't read or. Uh, Right, is um, was he was a shepherd or yeah, it's like a uh, more pastoral, shepherd, yeah, writer, like more rural. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he took care of uh, sheep or uh, goats. I don't know something like that. And, well, it's, <laughs> an, it's an, I, I think that some of this has been translated. I think I've seen this before, and it's much more like simplistic and like yeah, simplistic about nature. It, yeah, yes. Uh, it talks about, for example, uh, Suarez is more like Pessoa himself. He says yeah. somewhere that it's only half uh, neutronum, not really uh, like uh, Ricardo Reis, or Ricardo Reis is to, supposedly to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's more, um, he writes a more Latinized or classical uh, kind of poetry. And uh, you have uh, Cairo, it's, he's the natural poet. He writes about nature in a very simplistic way. Um, uh, so he, he uses this reference to say, sometimes he says, oh, Cairo is one of my masters. Because he's so simplistic <laughs> and he goes to, yeah. you, you understand? So, like, um, he's an influence. And sometimes he says that uh, Cairo is actually an influence over uh, Ricardo Reis, another heteronym, yeah. uh, though he's, um, even though he's more, um, in, he writes a more classical uh, kind of poetry, uh, and, and uh, Cairo is the natural paganist. Uh, so it's another um, characteristic that I like in uh, so this way of uh, mingling uh, uh, people that really don't exist, they only in the head. So yeah. <laughs> it was a bit, maybe it was schizophrenic, I don't know. <laughs> no, it was, yeah, yes, some nice story. But, um, that's sort of the game that's going to come up. It's like a, a preview. But um, in the next season, we're going to be doing Antoine Volodin's, uh Radiant Terminus. And that's something that comes up in Volodin's, like world of his literature, where he has different characters who appear in books that are also authors of other books about mm. similar characters. So they all like sort of interplay with their different different heteronyms um, in that as well, which is, is makes it very fun and very interesting to unpack the more that you read of him. But I like that too. I also, the, when you say this thing about um, I am what I see, there is also like a weird, I am the size of what I see. There's like a weird uh, way that that it seems to influence Soros's uh, philosophy too, where like, most everything that he's relating are things that he sees and how they're interpreted like visually or into his dream world or into his mind. And it's much like, not only is it like the physical world that he's only describing there, but there's something about like the process of it being what he's sensed that becomes what he's able to write about. And um, that kind of creates that the uh, almost like a, uh, not Kantian, but like a sort of locked in this to like what he's able to, to write about or say is restricted to like his physical being, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Uh, when I read, so I get back to uh, Lisbon or Portugal from right. that time. The, the you know the the, the the clerks, the shop assistants. The I can see it in my mind. So that's why it's quite uh, though we, especially in the book of this quiet, not so much. For example, in Alvaro the Campos, is quite. Uh, straightforward, very visual, very um, sometimes violent. Um, though it goes, uh, this book reminds me of another um, Portuguese writer, uh, Raul Brandão. He wrote a book called in Portuguese Humus, not the Humus that nowadays we, we eat in <laughs> the, the um, another Humus, but um, it's not translated in English, I guess. No. Oh. Probably not, but uh, it's a book. It, it's a novel, but it's very difficult to read as a novel. Read it as a novel because it's, it's more or less like the book of this quiet. It's like fragments and uh, reflections 
over what he sees or what he uh, senses when he walks or uh, throughout the streets or um, looking throughout the window or uh, you get a sense of what he was feeling or sensing and I guess he does it quite well. At least, I, I think so does it better than uh, in this case uh, Brandon. Um, but yes, uh, I agree with you in that sense. There is like related to that too, section 259 begins with the sense of smell is like a strange way of seeing. It evokes sentimental landscapes out of a mere sketch in our subconscious minds. And then at the end of that paragraph, it's like, I'm overcome quite unexpectedly by the smell of the wooden crates being made by the box maker. Ah, Cesario, you appear before me, and at last I'm happy because through memory I have returned to the one truth that is literature. Which seems to get to that too of like that creation of the sense. And this, this section does have a lot of stuff about like what literature is or like what writing is. Like not only that, like why, why write if I can't write better, but there's a whole bit about the romantics. There's a whole bit about like what romantics is. You, know, you, you write to like, to all writing is to like describe reality, I believe is one of the lines here. Um, and then also related to reading. Like I read and I am set free. I gain objectivity. I've ceased to be my usual disparate self. And what I read rather than being a mere invisible suit that sometimes weighs on me, becomes instead the great clarity of the outside world in which everything is worthy of note. The sun that everyone can see, the moon that weaves a web of shadows on a still earth, the vast spaces that open out into the sea, the dark solidity of the trees waving aloft their green branches, the solid peace of ponds and gardens, the past thick with vines on the terrace slopes of the hills. I feel like someone abdicating from life. Like there's like that whole, like what the relationship is between reading and writing and the purpose of literature. It comes up a lot in these, like this little section today, more so than some of the other ones that we've gone through, it seems. Yes, I, I highlighted some passages, like you said, the romantics, and yeah. sometimes he says, "I, I can, I can only find repose in reading the classics." Yep. Uh, he talks a lot about Vieira. Vieira is another Portuguese writer from. Uh, he was a, actually a priest, a missionary priest, and he yeah, he wrote some sermons, like uh, sermons to the fish, talking to the fish. Well, he was in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Still a colony, so um, uh, sometimes he talks about Chateaubriand. That he yeah. is more like uh, uh, there is no passage. There is one other. Yeah, I yeah. forget where that is, but I have that marked. Uh, I didn't. I liked it, so I, I missed it. No, but yes, he talks a lot about um, writing or influence. Sometimes he says that uh, he takes influence not only from these writers that we are talking about, but also from Senor Vasquez, his boss. So you see, he takes influence from uh, his life and his work and uh, his relation to other people. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, oh, one more that's related to that. Um, no, two, 247, the first line mm -hmm. is recognizing that reality is a kind of illusion and that illusion is a kind of reality is simultaneously necessary and pointless which I really like. And then on 267, I know no pleasure like that of books, and yet I read little. Books act as introductions to dreams, and such introductions are unnecessary to someone who can so easily and instinctively enter into conversation with dreams. <laughs> like. See, I tried to use that on my teachers in college. Why would I read this whole thing? I could just dream, like, it's just to get me started. Yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't buy that, though. <laughs> they weren't progressive back in the day. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Is there anything else that you guys wanted to touch on in this? Not really. I was just some, really some inspired passage. by that that sense of smallness um, yeah. that we had read about because it made me think. I don't know. I don't know enough about literature, but it might be something for somebody that you know has their PhD or something. I'm I'm curious if around that time, if there was a trend of of kind of um, focusing in and being very small in in the way you. You were viewing the world through your through your um, geography, because uh, around that time, like, it made me think of, like instantly of something like Winesburg, Ohio, where it's yeah. just one one little town, and you get the idea of what all of America may be like from one tiny little town that nobody cares about, or or the way Faulkner at that around that time, everything was that one county, and yeah. just this huge giant world of fiction all comes out of one tiny little rural Mississippi county. And, and and with this, like just like one street in 
in one part of Lisbon and it's just this giant world and all these thoughts and this huge, this huge expanse opens up from being so small. I wonder if it's, it's some sort of uh, pushback from a world war or all the entanglements of, you know, the burgeoning globalism or something. These are things that I'm not smart enough to, <laughs> to really think about or, but like as a hypothesis, I wonder if there's some sort of connection between um, the echo of, of World War One and this idea of being small and quiet and 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 seeing things bigger than. I mean, that is that part, of, part of that whole modernist project too of all those those writers that like if you can and Ulysses would be a good example of this too. Like if you can bring everything into one mind or one space, you're able to accomplish more than trying to describe the world at large. You're just not sure. seeing the internal psychological necessities of it, and that bringing things closer makes it makes it possible to to do that. But yeah, Ulysses is a perfect example of that. Like one, yeah. all you need is one city, man. One city I, you can make. I really always appreciate work. things like, cause there's always kind of like, you can be ocean wide and, and puddle deep, or mm -hmm. you can be like this, like a well where it's very, you know, very small, but the, the depth of it is, is massive. I like guess the same amount of, same amount of water, I guess it's just the way you want to, want to corral it. Right. Yeah. Um, and like to me, this has that, that this idea of like the well, where it, the, the borders are very small, but it goes so 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 deep. Which is why, like a lot of people reference that. Um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, is it uh, Javier Miestras? I forget what the last name is, but uh, the journey around my room. That that short novella that's all set within one small space. It seems to like be reflected or come out of this as well. Yeah, be, be along the same lines. Do but, you have a favorite yeah, line, if, Brian? If, oh, I do. So if there's somebody out there that's uh, that studies this kind of stuff for a living, I'd be really interested if they had a, yeah. a comment or a, they could just be like, no, you're an idiot. That's not, ex that's not at all what's happening. Or, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> curious where this idea of this idea of smallness, you know, the, uh, I, I really, I was, uh, I was also inspired. I also find it very liberating the, the containment of something very, very small and exploring like every, every aspect of it. It's, right. Um, let's see. Um, Give me one second. I know I had a couple written down here. Do you have one that's, I know you've already well, read you, a couple, but. You can go if you have one. I, I like this passage. Uh, this is fragment or section, let me see, 234. I feel physically sickened by ordinary humanity, which is besides the only kind there is. <laughs> so, Circled so, and underlined, exact same thing. Exactly. <laughs> so, that, that one reminded me more of your book than any other yeah, last exactly. entire section. I see it. It's a bit yeah, it's it's same, it's same. I feel like we can make that the like tagline. <laughs> yeah. Probably. If you are physically sickened by ordinary humanity, which is besides the only kind there is, read the translator's pride. <laughs> yes, yes <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good blur. But <laughs> <laughs> do that. The one that I have is on uh, oh, section 241. Um, only those who are unable to think what they feel obey grammatical rules. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate. I don't know. I think since we just had had some midterm elections and um, our president is uh, in Europe spreading the wonderful news of America, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but... Uh, I, and, uh, the two on 222 uh, and our version's on page 238 um, it starts with one should abandon all duties even those not demanded of us reject all cozy hearths even those that are not our own live on what is vague and vestigial among the extravagant purples of madness and the false lace of imagined majesties just just wow, just seem perfect yeah. seem perfect for our time i remember that was like yeah <laughs> That totally fits. That totally fits. So. I'm gonna abandon yeah, he, all hope yeah. along with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, he actually has a lot of passages that you can that, that fit nowadays reality. Actually, it's we, one one of his, his we most really need interesting to uh, features. Actually. We really need to get on this like multiple Instagram heteronym <laughs> accounts that are just Kurt and Pessoa. And one could be like a political based one on, on the reality. One can be your sad emo boy and uh, another can be like, like sarcastic, humanity hating uh, character. Like it would be great to just have them all exist and like play off one another in the way that, in the way that he does in his books. It does make you think that's, I think maybe part of the, the genius episode is that it's, it's so rooted in like 
hu like humanness and human nature that it's never it'll always be relevant for the times i, th I don't yeah. think it's gonna ever go out of style and it'll, it probably won't be stopped it'll, it'll always be read because it's always it's always applicable to what's going on yeah know? yeah i mean even like i mean there are those sections we went through before that had like the misogynistic overtones or like the weird pedophilia one um but uh <laughs> Less that about that, the better. But like the vast majority of this isn't isn't that. It's based in like more ph philosophy of what it is to be human or to see or to feel or to to experience the fact that like that that life is complex and not not always mm -hmm. what you want it to be in dreams. I and mean, these, it's, yeah. so it does seem like it would be it's a much more lasting than a book that had been tied to like here is Lisbon in 1929. Exactly. Uh, that. Yeah. It's this that that smallness, like you're saying, of like is what he sees and what he sees is what he is as a human so yeah that, what? that's what makes it interesting even nowadays because for example at school when uh, you have to read a lot of uh, writers one of one of, of those writers is cesar river that uh, you were talking about last podcast you don't know you didn't know i guess it was brian you were saying oh i don't, I don't know cesar river maybe he was another poet for his poet right. uh, for example you have to read it uh, read him at school or uh, you have a lot of writers that you have to read uh, and most people students they don't like it. it's it's boring but uh, when you get to so uh, at least some part of so it still resonates in uh, today's students and i find that interesting because most of the, the canonized authors uh, are not so uh, relatable today yeah. For example, Cesare Verdi talks a lot about tuberculosis and people <laughs> cutting blood and all this stuff. <laughs> the curtains are red. The teacher would say, you know, listen, children, the, the curtains are red because it's symbolic. It, it, re it, re it represents the blood that the, the poor lady is she's coughing the blood. <laughs> people don't relate to that. <laughs> you know, you won't die from tuberculosis in a country like ours. So. Yeah. No, people don't want to. <laughs> so you mean. People don't die of consumption anymore either, right? No, no consumption. <laughs> consumption. <laughs> like a West, old Western. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so you see one, but uh, so uh, still, um, you, you know, it, it still resonates. It still has some some really good passages and poems. And, yeah, and that's yeah, what some, I say, yeah, it's, some some of his uh, poems, or um, I, I'm not saying full poems or whatever, but some of his passages are so well known in Portuguese that we use it as uh, daily. Um, aphorisms for example right. uh, one of those i don't know how to translate it in, in english it's a uh, primeiro estranhas depois entranhas it's a, a wordplay it's like it's very difficult to um, to translate in english probably it's translated but i don't know how it's uh, for example first you find it strange but then you um, you get used to it and you um, almost like you incorporate that that reality but in portuguese it's it sounds really nice even today um, or uh, there are some passages that they use a lot even today some musical lyrics because that sounds like a really really, bad, really really good that sounds like a really bad pickup line at a bar like well, at first you're gonna find it strange but you'll get no, used you, to it yeah, yeah. yes you can <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, bye <laughs> but i was quoting pessoa <laughs> i thought women love poetry why are you leaving me <laughs> uh, but it totally makes sense as to like why so many people become obsessed with him for all sure. these reasons that we're saying and like to that point, if you're in New York City this weekend, there's a Pessoa Festival that's taking place on, I believe, Friday and Saturday. Um, there's information online. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes and then the posts and everything. But yeah, there's that still goes on. And like the disquiet, um, the the writers' conference that takes place in Lisbon is obviously influenced by Pessoa. And every year, every time there's a new version of this, there's more and more people who are like <laughs> discovering Pessoa and believe that he's just like one of the greatest.
just I, yeah. and I and I should say I do really like him. I, I dismissed this book several times, but it's just because there's too much of it. I think that <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. down I, I, I totally, I totally I'm on board with you it. because it's it's it, and sometimes it even gets um, weird or strange or uh, annoying because as I was telling you before we started the podcast yeah. um, or the live stream. Um, I know this book by uh, so many versions of this book and the fragments. For example, I was uh, checking the sections, the numbering you have in this edition, the new edition. It doesn't fit at all with the, the ones I know from Portuguese because even the, they, they are organized in different ways. And every time you read the book, it's different. So, Okay, it's yeah. like you don't have uh, because now you have it in almost chronological um, order, but you have a lot of editions in Portuguese mainly that doesn't uh, don't follow this order. And since yeah. it wasn't published during uh, Pessoa's lifetime, you have to you really don't know how to um, to publish them. So. In a sense, it's a good way to um, to uh, reveal his work to uh, new readers that don't know so, and uh, they they start to read yeah. his work. But uh, when you know his work, sometimes it gets uh, it's annoying. <laughs> to be yeah. honest, it's quite annoying too. <laughs> because oh no, I don't. And now they they had some fragments that that weren't published before and. You can't really see what they add to the edition. I would, yeah. just, I would just cut this part or this section. This doesn't really mean a lot. I don't know. I doubt that uh, the writer wanted it to be included, but okay. Uh, right. There are options. Academics want it. Yeah. Well, exactly. Need it. So. Well, anyways, well, thank you again for joining us. And anyone who's a bookseller that's listening to this, if you're at Winter Institute, Shao's book will be on in the gallery room as one of our special promotions for from Open Letter. Um, and if you, and either way, you should order it from our website. You can uh, you can contact me if you're a reviewer, or a bookseller, and want it. I will send it to you. We have a PDF basically ready to go. Um, you can Brian. They can find you online at uh, at Brian Wood underscore. I'm not really online much, but yeah, why not? Why not? Say hi. Why not? Just go follow. Just go follow Brian. He's got a book coming out next at the same time. You guys should do an event together. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun. Why not? Why? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, do it in, we'll do it in Portuguese. I'll fake it. <laughs> That's great. We used to have Portuguese bakery here in Rochester. Mm -hmm. um, bakery. Yeah. Yeah. But we can. We can. We should do an event. Like we'll have you come. Yeah. yeah why not? <laughs> great. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Why not? And um, you can always follow follow us at uh, open underscore letter or at Chad W. Post on all Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Um, otherwise, next week we are going through sections 274 through 315, um, which is another chunk. We have four episodes left in this season, which seems insane. Um, but cool. We'll keep, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's going to be funny lines. It's going to be funny. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Anyways, take care until next week. You like D&D, Audrey Hepburn, Fangoria, Harry Houdini, and Croquet. You can't swim, you can't dance, and you don't know karate. Face it, you're never gonna make it. I don't wanna make it. I just wanna. Make it.